we begin so that everybody can get the full hour of the fun stuff we're going to do. I'm Cheryl McCartney, again, mentioning that I'm a member of Bethel's Lifelong Learning Committee, and we have with us today Jane Gaben and Donna Goldstein, who are the co-chairs of our committee, and Jack Wrights, who is the Director of Engagement with Jewish for Good, and he is going to be helping us with any technical issues. Um, we're today talking about this book, Hurts Like a Jewish Mother, and the speakers today are in our Rosie Rubin and Ruby Rosen, which you who you can see. They tell me that this is not your standard book talk. They also tell me that this is the first time they've done it on Zoom, so we're all going to be very supportive as we all get more tips. And this will be more of a lighthearted hour in which we connect around Jewish life, and it will involve your participation. So Ruby Rosen and Rosie Rubin are the authors, but you won't be surprised to learn that those aren't their real names. While they do answer to Rosie and Ruby, they also answer to Jennifer and Lauren. And the person with the straighter brown hair is Jennifer, and the one with the curly brown hair is Lauren. They are longtime friends and collaborators, having written other books, articles, and having founded and run a company together. Now, I want to tell you that there are rave reviews on the back of the book written by Rose Hashana, Chava Nagila, and Hana Ka. So we're looking forward to your presentation. And please do ask any questions. Uh, you can unmute yourself if you'd like to interrupt and ask questions. I believe the authors will want you to participate mm -hmm. and unmute yourself. And they have a multimedia presentation for you. Um, so they may be checking in with Jack here and there to get all of the audio and video for your enjoyment. Rosie, Ruby, take it away. <laughs> Thank you, Cheryl. And thank you all so much for including us in the Lifelong Learning Program. We want to welcome everyone to our workshop, which we informally call Let's Have Some Jewish Fun Together. And in the spirit of this program, we hope to do some lifelong learning together and have a little fun. I'm Lauren Franklin. I'm Jennifer Weiss. But we also go by our pen names. Ruby Rosen. And Rosie Rubin. So we were invited here today to talk about our book, and thank you, Cheryl, for holding it up, Hurts Like a Jewish Mother. This book is a humorous take on keeping up with Jewish customs in a modern world. We're also here to hear what you have to say, so be prepared for a lot of audience participation. That may require you all put your cameras on at some point. <laughs> but we're going to make sure we're going to try to create an enjoyable afternoon together hearing from you. We'll talk a little bit more about the book shortly, but for those of you who may not have seen it or not familiar with it, uh, Hurts Like a Jewish Mother is an adult, thank you, is an adult picture book, and um, it uses, it's an abecedarian, it uses the alphabet for the Aleph Bet, um, and it's a loving poke at traditions we have as Jews. And our goal today is to use the ideas in our book as really a springboard for conversation and connection. Together with you, we'll have some fun exploring different aspects of Jewish life, some that may evoke nostalgia and some that are more contemporary. We'll delve into the richness and the complexities that we all experience and that give being Jewish the significance that it has in our lives. And because we are all about humor, and because Jewish people have a reputation for being funny, uh, we saw, thought we'd start with a funny clip that hits a key theme from the Jewish experience. The send up of the quest to find the perfect Jewish mate. So this clip is from a web series called Yid Life Crisis. 
and it has Canadian comedians, Jamie Ellman and Eli Battalion. And the guest in this episode is Mayim Bialik. And the premise of the clip, and we're just going to show an excerpt from it, is that one of the men has brought his best friend with him on a blind date. He does this because he's worried that the date might misfire and he wants his friend to help him make the early exit. But as you'll see, he actually enjoys the date and it's really his friend he wants to leave early. So you're going to see a few minutes of this. We'll just set it up for you. Should I check? Oh, no. Oh, yeah, it's probably here. You see it? Yeah, here it is. Okay. And now I have to so go back. They're having lifelong learning in PowerPoint and Zoom. Yes. We're learning all sorts of things. Okay, can everybody see it? Yes, beautifully. Okay. And we at the right place. Wow. Right. Yep. Yeah. Okay, here we go. Ich war was bin ich schon dein Kind hätte. Machen uns stell, also du bist der Coin. Weil bis geht schlecht, schlapp mich raus. Weil bis geht geht, schlapp sich raus. Was krieg ich von dir? Äh, wir machen von dir die Steigerung von der letzten drei Jahre zurück. Ask him. Uh, I just ran into my buddy Laser here out front and uh, I've never seen a kosher California roll, so. Are you Jewish? Depends on your definition. <laughs> of course he's Jewish. We went to Hebrew school together for 17 no, it's years. It's not a black and white question. What's your name? Jaime. Single? <laughs> Depends <laughs> on your definition. Okay, let's get started. How do you feel about children? Yes, no, how many? Excellent question. I'd like at least two children, possibly three, God willing, at least a boy and a girl, so as the Talmud says, to replace ourselves on earth and continue the traditions of our fathers and matrilineal descent. Good. And you? Uh, I just came for the sushi. You don't want children? No, I, I, I might want, I, I don't know. I, just, I think the question in and of itself is uh, ridiculous. <laughs> Excuse me? Well, I just mean, you're, you're, you're looking for a potential spouse here. Is the relationship between the two of you not going to play into any of this? I'm uh, going to get there. You're the one that said you had no time. <laughs> he has mild hypoglycemia, actually. Can we have some sushi? No, no, I, I appreciate the honesty. How do you feel about eating kosher in, out of the house? Well, Great you see, the question. Bible was written by a cabal of sages, let's call them, uh, who used a story and narrative uh, based in Bronze Age uh, polytheism. Uh, mythology I'm so sorry, my mother is calling. <laughs> I better get this. Hello, Ma. The house smells nicht. Yeah, yeah. Sie sagst, was du kennst, nicht leiden. Wenn sie sagst, was ich will, also ich werde dir. Geh weg, Mami. Ah, so sorry. My mother, too, I got up. Oh, yeah. Yo, Mami, entschuldig mir, aber ich will bleiben. Ihre Steitigkeit ist erotisch. Sie ist nicht für dich, sie ist für mich. Ja. Verschwind, Mami. Verstehe, verstehe. Ich hoffe, dass wir zwei Schmänderiken sind, die meinen, dass ich nicht kein Jedisch und Pater in unserer Zeit. I'll call you back. A romantische Nacht. A lange Schabes Mahlzeit und danach a doppelte Mitzvah. Netflix und chillend. Drei Welten, die beschreiben euch am besten. Hedonist. Atheist. Feminist. Jid. Boche. Itzt. Balibs der Film. Uh, Sterne mit Hommes. <laughs> Spaceballs. Bas Mitzwe oder Sisse Sechsten. Verwusst euch Obzug in ihre jüdische Jerusche oder von einem uh, Amerikaner Minik. Ich wurde investiert durch zerpatterte Geld für ihre Erziehung. Uh, ich spreche Geschichte von Tay-Sex. Nein. Schlechten Morgensyndrom? Ja. Yeah. Nobelpremies? Ja, ja, ja. Meinigen wegen Heimdelzion. Vaccinierung? Geben die Brust. Kriminale Vergangenheit. Rezept Narkotik bei Delfinisch. Infektion krank. Reise kein Misrech Afrika in den letzten sechs Monaten. Frische Fruchten? Nein. Nein. 
Was du gerne etwas nicht für die Frucht? Nein, 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 Okay, we didn't want to do the whole clip, but we thought you'd get a taste of it. So I don't know if any of you had a similar dating experience, but we thought it certainly uh, does reflect some people's experience. And that's not quite been our exact experience. Um, so we thought we'd share a little bit about ourselves. Um, we met 30 years ago at the start of college and we gravitated to each other uh, when we mutually came up with the idea of finding a Friday night service to attend to get, again, together. We knew that when you come to a foreign place, which for us in this case was college, uh, it's important to find your grounding and a synagogue seemed to be the place to fit the bill. The fact that we knew there would be wine and you boys only influenced our decision slightly. Well, the night didn't actually work out as planned because en route to the synagogue, we found an all night sale at a clothing store. Couldn't pass that up. We went to dinner, had drinks, maybe met some cute boys. And at that point, the synagogue was just a distant memory. The next year, we moved into an exclusive women's dormitory, which seemed almost designed to provide the perfect Christian experience. The building replete with its Venus de Milo statue, formal gold drapery and grand piano was a throwback to the culture of when it was established in 1915. There was grace before dinner, uh, which was served on fine china. In December, the Christmas celebration was started with caroling at six in the morning, followed by a big Christmas breakfast. There were even dorm wide Easter egg hunts and every Sunday morning, large collections of young women would head off together to church. We clearly stuck out like sore thumbs, and we banded together as outsiders. And really for us on some deep level, one element that tied us together was that we were Jewish. And we embraced this outsider status and we really decided that we had to bring Jewish culture into this dormitory. Um, we felt obligated to show all of these fine Christian women how the other half lives, or maybe how the other 2% of the population, the Jews, live. So we formed an interfaith committee. We managed to get the dorm to cough up some money so we could have hamantash and then latkes at all the different holidays. Um, and we even um, made sure there was an electric menorah. It sort of paled next to the glorious Christmas tree, but still we felt triumphant. And and these were the seeds for you know, our future Jewish connection together. And we have evolved from the days of the electric menorah, but the customs and the traditions have still kept us together. And we finally made it to the synagogue together here today, even if it's a Zoom workshop. We're a your synagogue, that's how we see it. Um, so now that you know a little bit about us, we want to learn more about you. So um, we're going to start with what we see as some important questions he that are really going to get to the heart of who you are so that we'll know who's in the room and get to understand a little bit more about you. So um, we're going to share our PowerPoint and um, we're going to have questions that have two possible answers. So we're going to want to know what, what you identify with, which answer, and then we might ask you why you chose the answer that you did. Right, because we think it'd be very insightful to learn about you. Exactly. Oh, sure. no, we're good. Okay. So, okay. So our first question, favorite Jewish superhero. Yes. Yes, Queen Esther or Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Who's your favorite super Jewish superhero? So feel free to unmute and jump in. Donna, do you want to jump in? 
Oh, Jane. Jane or Jay? Oh, we can't hear you on mute. mute. Okay. I, I can hear you. I don't know that you can see me, but um, shouldn't it be super heroin? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Besides that, it's, it's Ruth. It's Ruth. Ruth. Okay. Do you want to tell us why? Because she's contemporary. She's really, well, she's Jewish and she's, she was uh, before us, but not remote. She's within our lifetime. And she, um, she said what she wanted for many, many years, not like Queen Esther, who just, it was one time thing and resulted in a lot, in a lot of people's deaths. If you read the whole Miguel. So she, Ruth, Ruth is my favorite. Well put. Right. Very nice. All right. Does anybody else want to share an answer? I mean, maybe Queen Esther was actually ruthless. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, notice that in the chat there is a response. Thank you oh, so much for you. putting that out. Oh, very nice. Thank you. Okay. 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 Um, who else wants to answer this question before we move to the next one? Anyone? I don't uh, want to have to choose between the two, but I would love a, uh, hol a, a holiday on the level of Purim to, to celebrate um, Ruth as well. So that's my <laughs> proposal is not choosing between either, but uh, let's get another holiday on the books. Right. I, I'm, I, that's a great one. I like it. All right, let's move to the next question. Everybody ready? And we're going to expect a few answers here. Would you rather share a babka with Barbara Streisand or Chuck Schumer? We could add Diane Feinstein if that's not enough for you. Do we have to share it? <laughs> <laughs> How about sitting with them while you're eating the babka? Right. right. Who would you pick? You could each have your own. Richard, would, do you want uh, to tell us who? Yeah. Go ahead, Richard. No, I don't have anything else. I, I'd rather <laughs> not share it, but if I had to <laughs> sit there with one of them, I guess I guess Chuck Schumer, because I like to talk politics. Okay. Great answer. It's good. Yes. I think somebody else was going to say something before I cut them off accidentally. Oh, I, I was just going to agree with Richard, although Barbara Streisand was um, a trailblazer and at, at the age that she was in um, entertainment and she actually expanded herself to becoming a director, <coughs> et cetera. Um, it is sort of more contemporary for me to think about Chuck Schumer. Mm -hmm. Right. Barbara Streisand, you might be able to get sort of like a dinner theater experience. Well, I mean, I I actually have thought about this in that she and um, Robert Redford were in movie together and he kind of developed into sharing his love of theater with developing some kind of an indie festival. And he, you know, really developed himself that way, sort of outer directed where she was interviewed about some fancy house that she built and decorated. And I was reflecting on how the, what the difference was with what they did with their gifts. That's, That's interesting. Yeah, it's very interesting. All right, moving to our next question. Right. You're used to thinking red or white and we mean wine, but here with Passover coming up, this is a key question to think about. No takers, any preferences? I, I like the red one. Red? Mm -hmm. The white one is just too hot. <laughs> well, I, I think the red one is a little more festive and adds some color to the Seder plate. <laughs> all right, well, you'll you'll have to- all And we're, you can see we're learning a lot about you. These are very, very this important is, questions, getting right. at your essence. <laughs> all right, and our final question, 
of the icebreakers, we like to refer to them, is your plans for this 4th of July. Will you be indulging in a Hebrew national hot dog or the new Manischewitz gefilte dog? <laughs> and we think if you want the gefilte dog, you might want to go for it this year. We're not sure if they're going to get enough sales to repeat it for next year. Right. Does that appeal to anyone, the gefilte dog? No. No. <laughs> No, does anyone think that the gefilte fish itself is kind of like a gefilte dog? So why no need? Okay, so no takers on the gefilte dog. Going once, going twice. I'd be, right. willing, to, I'd be willing to try it. <laughs> See, I like that you want your whole babka and a gefilte dog. <laughs> we share this. Excellent. All right, well... I'm glad that we've started to get to know you. That is not the end. There are going to be other chances for you to talk to us about your thoughts, your Jewish history, your Jewish customs. We're going to take the screen down for a minute here and um, go on to the next part of our program here. So obviously this is a book event, so it wouldn't be right if we didn't talk a little bit about the origin of the book and then have a chance to quickly read it to you. Um, and so we want to tell you sort of how this book came about, which is that we conceived it during the pandemic when we were in the midst of lockdown isolation. We live in different cities and we were used to seeing each other a lot. We had always made it a priority, but this of course got disrupted during the pandemic as so many things did. And we wanted to find a way to stay connected and writing this book was born from that desire. Mm -hmm. I mean, and all of our lives obviously were changed dramatically by the pandemic and some in some very significant and difficult ways, of course. And But there are also just many changes to the routines that we've been accustomed to and, and the ways that we lived our lives and not just working from home or missing celebrating birthdays with friends, but also how we celebrated being Jewish the Zoom Passover seders, the canceled Rosh Hashanah services, bat mitzvahs that were you know put off, and how many of you know people who ended up having bar and bat mitzvahs at age fifteen or sixteen? And so, with all those Jewish customs altered in our own lives, we realized it wasn't the easiest time to feel connected as Jews, right? You ended up being at home when you might have wanted to go to the synagogue um, and com commune with your fellow Jews. So we thought one way that we could combat how we were feeling this kind of isolation was to write a book to steep ourselves in thinking about Jewish tradition. And we thought at first, you know, we could do something earnest, like about the beauty of the Shabbat candles burning brightly or the wonderful smell of latkes filling the home during Hanukkah. But instead, we came up with a more humorous approach <laughs> to the Jewish mother, because some of these traditions can challenge a Jewish mother or anyone in a good year. But if you add in a multi-year pandemic, well, you can have some serious complications. And we're going to read the book. So we want to make this a real book event. And uh, it wouldn't feel that way if we didn't read an excerpt from our book. But given that we wrote an ABC Darian picture book with 26 letters, um, we can read it in two minutes. So we think we'll just share the entire text. And we're just gonna go to the top here, if I can. Okay, can everybody see our book? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so as you can see, Hurts Like a Jewish Mother, um, written by Ruby Rosen and Rosie Rubin, our alter egos. And we had the pleasure of having this illustrated by an Israeli illustrator, Gal Weitzman, which was great because she knew what a horror was and what chametz was, and we didn't have to explain anything. That made the process a lot easier. So now we're going to read through the book. Abby blew her savings, bankrolling the bat mitzvah. Batya was distraught. Her boy dated a shiksa. Chava was trampled while dancing the horror. The Yad speared Daphna when she read the Torah. Braiding the Chala, Eve tied herself in a knot. Franny fainted at the party. The cold cuts weren't glot. 
Hila's knees, knees buckled, bowing down in the Elena. When the wind took Hannah's wig, she screamed, Dayenu! Eating meals in the sukkah gave Ilana frostbite. Caught sneaking lobster, Judith turned ghost white. While burning the chametz, Karen lit up like a spark. Tree hugging on two bishvat, Leah was clawed by the bark. Michal's fingers got stuck on a mezuzah that had been fro that had frozen. Noah's folks sat Shiva when she changed her name from Rosen. Aura crashed into a tree, racing home for candle lighting. Panina clogged an artery. The latkes too inviting. Keshet was discovered doing laps in the mikvah. On Purim and Aaron Grager almost impaled Rivka. Tikiagadola had Sarah gasping for air. Hiding the afikomen, Tal was pinned by the chair. A bird's eye view at the bris left Yulia aghast. Vered was skin and bones, post Yom Kippur fast. The rabbi's interminable sermon knocked Wendy out cold. The Seder's fourth cup of wine made Xenia too bold. Constant Hebrew school complaints fueled Yael's malaise. Zelda needed extra rest, Shabbat for seven days. So there was our book. You probably, this is probably the only book event where the authors could read the entire book right, right here in front of you. Right. We could do it 30 more times, but we won't. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So um, now that we've read through the book, it's sort of clear to everyone exactly what kind of workshop you signed up for. It's not really a deep dive into interpretations of the Talmud. It's something a little bit more lighthearted. And the archetypal... Uh, so Jewish mom theme used in the book it offers a hook for humor, but it's really intended to speak to every person who you know holds or seeks a connection to Jewish culture. You know, whether you're a mom or a dad or a sister or a brother or a grandparent or partner or friend, we are all Jewish moms in some ways. And you know, we kind of see it that the Jewish mom in each of us may look for ways to be celebrating our shared history or culture and heritage or to be you know creating openings for teaching moments on religion and culture or even to be sort of acknowledging and, and bridging differences among us so we want to talk about our personal and shared jewish experiences the absurd examples and illustrations in our book are really just a jumping off point for discussion. The real point of this workshop is to create openings for you and your dialogue. So we tried to have these 26 opportunities to make you smile using the alphabet. Um, but, and you know, we wanted to spur your own creative thoughts for your recollections and thoughts about Jewish customs. But if you leave our presentation with some enthusiasm and fun about the role of Jewish culture in your life, then we'll sort of feel like this has been a success. And so we thought it would be interesting um, to also take a look at the larger Jewish population in the U.S. You know, how much do we know about our fellow Jews in the U.S.? We have a few trivia questions to ask you about Jews in the U.S. Um, and we'll post the question. You can shout out your answer or put it in the chat or whatever is um, most convenient for you. Um, so. Of all the Jews in the U.S., what percentage would you think keep kosher at home? 9%, 17%, or 23%? Why doesn't everybody put their answers in the chat? Can we see the chat? I don't know. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh. Oh, 
Okay. So we've got some nines and some and some seventeens. And the actual answer is 17%. Um, so you guys did pretty well on that one. Now for the bonus round, which we don't have up here, how many kosher McDonald's do you think there are in Israel? Just take a guess, put it in the chat. <laughs> All of them. <laughs> All right, well, the, the actual answer is there are 64 kosher McDonald's, but 151 non-kosher, okay. mm -hmm. which, right, which actually means that 70% of the people eating Big Macs in Israel are eating non-kosher Big Macs. And certainly the cheeseburgers are all non-kosher, even mm -hmm. if, so they wouldn't get that in the kosher McDonald's. All right, on to our next question. Of all Jews in the U.S., what percentage held or attended a Seder last year? 36 percent, 49, or 62? Put them in the chat. Oh. And it's 62 percent. It's a lot. Um, and interestingly, the number of Jews who attended a Seder last year is markedly higher than the number who attended the synagogue for Yom Kippur, which in, is actually not that surprising given that one holiday is about food and festivity and the other is about not eating anything for 24 hours. Ooh. All right, moving along. Um, of all Jews in the U.S., what percentage do you think go to the synagogue at least once a month? All right, 11, 20, or 31? All right, any other answers? Okay, looks like we've got a lot of uh, different opinions here. So the actual answer is 20%. And while 20% of, mm -hmm. of Jews may be going monthly, we don't actually have the statistics of how many of those people are actually paying attention or following along yeah. while they're there. Right. Um, as we saw with Wendy in our book, sometimes that sermon can just be interminable. Mm -hmm. And the final question is, how much do we, uh, of all the Jews in the, the US, what percentage Visit historic Jewish sites when traveling. 18%, 38%, or 57%. And the answer is 57%. And everyone in the mountain. Right? Uh, well, and we all know that the kids really love being dragged to another Holocaust memorial. Um, and we don't actually know if going to the kosher McDonald's counts as a Jewish historical site. Um, so thank you for participating in the poll. Um, it seems like we all learn more about our fellow Jews. So that's useful, right? It's like a nice baseline to see where we fit in in the rest of our society. But um, in addition to talking about our fellow Jews, we want to talk about our other fellow Jews, you in the room with us. So we want to turn to you now. This is a chance for everyone in this group, again, audience participation, to share your ideas and provide insights into your customs and traditions and your thoughts about being Jewish. So we've prepared some questions and we look forward to having a discussion. So we're going to go to the next, the first question. When was the last time you felt Jewish? And we want you to share something about that experience. And, we should and, take the screen now okay, so again. again. And being at this workshop doesn't count. <laughs> so this is where you actually are going to talk. We're not going to use the chat right now unless you want to, but we'd love to hear. Think about when was the last time you felt Jewish or Jewish, as George Santos would say. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but let's not evoke George Santos if we can avoid it. 
<laughs> right. As, as, uh... Yes. Yeah. Jane. Uh, uh, yesterday, when I went to shul, mm -hmm. and afterwards, when I engaged with some of my um, the, the, the Yiddish group. Oh, that sounds nice. You must have liked the video we showed earlier with all the Yiddish. Yeah. <laughs> Did you understand it without the subtitles? Uh, you know, it's hard to tell, but I, I, I understood a lot, but I, you, when you see both, it, it goes into the brain. And so it's hard to tell them apart. Right. Yeah, that's great. All right. What, what about others? When's the last time you felt Jewish? Yes. Uh, I guess uh last night we had guests over for dinner and one of the couple was is jewish the other is not and it was interesting having the conversation with a lot of it about being jewish mm -hmm. and the other person well actually they're married and their their shared daughter was raised jewish and so we had a lot of discussion about being jewish very nice that's nice and we'll ask you later what you served. So that in mind. Wait, was it a babka? And would you have been willing to share it? <laughs> no. <laughs> that or dried out, dried out salmon, salmon. Wasn't that great? <laughs> what about you, Donna? I always feel Jewish. <clears throat> I don't, I, I've been going over this question and I don't think a day goes by without feeling I wear a Jewish star. I get up in the morning. I have some medical issues since I was in my 20s. And every morning I say, thank you, God, I'm still here. Um, I just always feel Jewish. I always think like a Jew. I, I plan like a Jew. I, I'm a Jew. <laughs> well put. <clears throat> Cheryl, you want to get in on this one? Uh, well, I was thinking the news about Israel is front and center for me. I recently read a book about Rudolf Verba, who was one of the few who escaped from Auschwitz to warn the world. That just came I, I went to um, like, uh, lunch and learn with the rabbi on Thursday, and he talked about suffering and what the Talmud has to say about it and cross-referenced it with modern scholars. Um, I sent my husband to buy some matzah in certain grocery stores we have near us, didn't have any, um, and I've got the name, I know now which one I have to go to, but interestingly, I think the ones who reluctantly had it, now they don't because they're deferring to Wegman, so that's where I'm going to have to go. So those, that's kind of my, just like Donna was saying, it's, it's in your whole self. Mm -hmm. Also, I had a chat yesterday with a childhood friend of mine and we were, re, I was telling her stuff about my dad and really how he had to relocate to the United States from Canada because he couldn't get a job because of anti-Semitism in Winnipeg, Manitoba. And that was in the 1940s. So kind of, it's in me. Right. Mm -hmm. It's really woven. But because I'm not from North Carolina and I've not been there for a long time, when you said that you couldn't get the stores because they're sold out or because they don't carry it? Well, this, I was kidding my husband last night. I said, these local grocery stores, you, if you go too early, they say, oh, we won't have that until just before the holiday. Or you can look in the international aisle with all the you know, Mexican and Indian and other things. And of course, it's not kosher for Passover, what they have there. Mm -hmm. um, or if you come the week before Passover, they say, oh, well, we already had that, but we don't stock a lot of it. So we're out now. Um, so the synagogue publishes names of, of stores. There's particular ones in a different town that usually have more. And then there's a store knew that is near us who I think I real I knew this sort of like idiot why did you try the other thing but he was going out to buy some other groceries so long story but I also lived in El Paso Texas for a while and it was the same thing I had come from Skokie Illinois where you didn't have to even ask and right. when I went to El Paso and I waited like I always did to the last minute for Hanukkah candles, I could not find them. 
So we're going to go to thank you for right, all that's, that. Right. That's interesting. Just to show the different locations, how it varies so dramatically. And you have to adjust as you move around. All right. So we have our next question here. What are some of the traditions that you have that you really enjoy or don't enjoy? And what might you want to change? So well, traditions that you have that you enjoy or don't enjoy and what you might want to change. Jack, you want to kick it off since we didn't get to hear from you in the last one? Oh, you know, here's here's my fun answer is that um, we, I, for many years, was the director of the summer camp here with Jewish for Good. Uh, and we run, we do Shabbat every Friday uh, as a, any good Jewish summer camp does. Mm -hmm. um, and it is a, it's an experience. Our, our camp is about half Jewish and about half not Jewish. Um, uh, I myself am not Jewish yet. I, you know, George Santos kind of, ruined it for me but i do feel a, a little jewish sometimes and feel like deep very deeply connected to the jewish community of of all the faith communities in the area this is the one that feels most tightly connected to me um but my answer to your question uh is that i love doing shabbat with these kids every friday the jews and non-jews um, my, you know, my favorite is having these little Christian kids run up and say like, it's time for Shabbat. It's time for Shabbat. We want the challah. Right. <laughs> and, uh, getting to expose people to, to Jewish culture, um, on a, on a weekly basis is really fun, especially seeing these little kiddos really get excited about something like that. Um, fills, fills my cup as it, as they say. Um, so I think that's my answer. Nice. I like that. It's nice. I also love Shabbat as well. <laughs> right, because you're like, where's my hala? Where's my hala? <laughs> yeah. My, I have a 15-month-old um, son who's got a, uh, he's probably got 50 words right now, but he does know hala. And uh, <laughs> on Friday, he was running around, around the house saying, hala, 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 hala. And it was adorable. <laughs> You're like, okay, he's got good judgment. But yeah, he's going to be okay. <laughs> All right, Jane, you got your hand up? Yeah. I was brought up in New York mm -hmm. where you don't have to be concerned about being left out. But my parents and their parents didn't belong to a synagogue. So Friday nights, uh, my they did uh, nothing. Uh, we did have a seder someplace, and we would go out to a seder. The world was divided into two kinds of people: us and them. And frankly, a part of your book bothered me, and it was the part about. Uh, Batya, she, she mm -hmm. it was a shiksa, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. We don't even use that word now. Uh, like shkutz, it's a shegetz. It, it's not a good word to use. Oh. Um, the next edition will be different. We're going to consult right. with you, Jane. Right. And uh, the other thing was, the other... The yad. It, it, it stabs, right? And... This is somebody who I now have a yacht. I know I, I've learned a little Hebrew, of it, very little, but I'm all for liberation. So I'm not Orthodox, but um, I don't know that I would want a non-Jew to know that you sit Shiva if your <clears throat> child is marrying mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. a non-Jew. I, I, it creeped me out a little bit. Mm -hmm. Some of the, some of it was fun. Some of the other things are funny. <laughs> yeah, Th this. Why is she stabbed? Because yeah. she deigns to read from the Torah. Oh. Yeah, that's an interesting. We that's did not interesting. take that I interpretation. Don't, yeah, really? Right. Oh, okay. Yeah. No, it was more just oh. like the perils of things that right. we were trying to come just up with. Just kind of like being hit with a grog or being stabbed with the yod, not because of. You right. know that women should not 
that, I mean, that's interesting. And yes. that would not, yeah. that that's, wouldn't make the second cut. So that right, the would not have that. To <laughs> amplify though with Jane is that these people are dressed like Hasidim and she wouldn't be reading from the Torah if she was in that sect. He does have a black hat. You do, you are correct on that. Right. The, 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 wouldn't I ever let her read if it was a Hasid, right. right. But they, and the, uh, you know, you've got people wearing wigs and various, I mean, like some of the ways these people are dressed does suggest that they're, um, let's see where else we could. Yeah, I mean, this certainly is, in Dianu, she has a wig. You're right. Yeah. yeah. And then this one, I mean, the long skirt and. Right. Well, our goal was we wanted to have Jews of all different backgrounds. So we did certainly uh, include okay. people who look differently. Um, right. It was to span sort of a range, but I can see why having that mm -hmm. be matched up, that range okay. being kind of matched there would create that image although mm. that certainly was not deliberate it right. was just to kind of span a broad you know the wide range of how you know, the jewish religion is you know experienced and uh, and the semites go after people who quote look jewish or uh, dress uh, jewish uh, that would be a worry to me mm -hmm. Interesting. This mm -hmm. is very interesting. We appreciate all the feedback. Right. No, that's okay. really that's helpful. Helpful. We have, you know, people have not said that before, but right. that it would be concerning to you if mm -hmm. people that it could be interpreted in that way. It's a negative stereotype of mm -hmm. Jews who outwardly look Jewish, mm -hmm. and particularly with all the unrest now, as we mentioned about in Israel, there is a divide between mm -hmm. the religious very religious committed people and the secular people and also New York there's a you know like there's publicity about how the religious Jews are um, predominant uh, sort of overrepresented on the welfare rolls and that they don't go to the public schools it kind of opens painful stuff mm -hmm. and then the other thing to add with what Jane was talking about is this particular shiksa is also stereotyped in what she looks like. And can I ask a slight, slightly pivoted question? <laughs> to, uh, I'm curious, one, I know that you've got a presentation that we're slowly making our way through, but I would, are, is part of the presentation talking about your relationship with the illustrator? Because I'd love to hear about how those, what that was like and how those decisions were made and, and how much input you all had and how much the illustrator had. Because it can go a lot of ways with an illustrated book. Right. I mean, can I jump, can I jump in before that? Because I have one answer to the last question again. Or yes. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. You want, <laughs> do you want to go back to slide, Richard? Of course. No, I'm, I'm really interested in your, your question. But, but I wanted to say that I don't enjoy, and I just realized again this past week or so. I don't enjoy Purim. Really? Because no, it's why? all a celebration of people getting killed. I mean, it's it's celebrating Jews surviving, but all the all the innocent people getting killed, not just Haman, but Haman's children and and the whole whatever the Amal, whatever the the whole community, his whole community. And and it's I think it's I don't know bothers me a lot. I, <laughs> I, I don't know what I, well, and when I was um, young, many, many years ago, um, I you know, was taught that Queen Vashti was, you know, evil. And now it's, you know, she's looked on very differently. Mm -hmm. And so it really is sort of interesting how we, you know, ideas have changed and how what we can view things through the different lens. But thank you for sharing that. All right. I mean, it's, you know, but, you know, to say that it, I could see why at one point people would want to celebrate Purim, but now when you look at it in a different lens, it doesn't seem quite so celebratory. That's right. It's when you actually read what the Megillah actually says, which so many of us didn't when we were young, get a little, have a little more interest, read a few commentaries. Um, 
so we still do want to hear from you on a few things. We're happy to talk about the illustrator as well. The illustrator, of course. Um, should we do that quickly right now? And sure. then we'll go on to the yeah. next thing. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it's, it's always a collaborative effort, but certainly illustrators don't like you to be too involved in the work they do, um, mm -hmm. which is often why if any of you are budding writers that want to write an illustrated book, if you send a book to a publisher, you can't really suggest much about the illustration because they like to pair you up with an yeah. illustrator of their choosing and they mm -hmm. like that illustrator to come up with what they want to do. Um, this is in some of our earlier books that we learned that the hard way when we were trying to have a little too much input yes. and our editors and publishers are like, that is not your role. So in this case, um, we did try to connect with the illustrator to make sure that there was humor in the book. That was the important thing. The goal was to take things lightly mm -hmm. and to exaggerate because it's kind of an absurdist book. Right. I mean, none of these things would happen to a person, right? right. It's, it's rare that you're rushing home for candlelighting and you bump into a tree. Like, it doesn't really happen. It's rare that you're hiding the afikoman and you get stuck on a chair because usually <laughs> you can just hide the afikoman in a way that is not dangerous. And so that was kind of the idea is we wanted her to have an absurdist quality to it, but ultimately she was going to do what she was going to do. So right. does that help at all? Right. On the back and it was kind of working with her, you, you sort of, it was her vision Although sort of at the margins, we could certainly you know, mm -hmm. have some input, but she's the yeah. illustrator. I think that's a great answer. Thank you. All right. Well, we have a few more questions for you. Um, so we always think it's interesting to think about our own traditions or customs and then assimilating those with other people. So our question here is whether anyone has had either a romantic relationship challenge or a uh, relationship with a parent or a child challenge because you have different approaches to your Jewish customs. You know, compromise, has anyone had to deal with that? Right, so challenges navigating things. Well, like when your 15 month old wants more challah yeah. <laughs> and right, like, no, right, okay, one more piece. I think Donna, you had something? I just wanted to say that my sister, is married to a non-Jewish man and his whole family is a large family and we all had to adjust to them all coming together and you know and, and that they did celebrate Christmas and they did celebrate you know in the beginning my mother was really upset my father passed away and after a while it's like you know you got to adjust to it this is this is what's happening you know and people are people um but like my grandparents generation if you even mentioned intermarriage, I mean, they would say Kaddish, that's it, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very true. Mm -hmm. Any other people want to mention any challenges they've had? No. I would, I would just comment that even a, a, com, a partnership of both people being in the same um, subset or of a Jewish tradition might still uh, have to work out differences in how they would or sell them. <laughs> yes, right. That's right. And I mean, and certainly, and in terms of sort of the parent and child, I know. Um, a rabbi whose approach is that if, um, if in terms of when a couple is one parent is or one partner is Jewish and the other is not, and that if they have children and they raise the children Jewish, you know, his take is I like to view that Judaism not necessarily flowing, you know, from the mother down to the children, but from the children up to the parents. And so if you have Jewish children and you want to raise them Jewish and that one makes you feel Jewish, then you can, that can be, you can be Jewish as well. So there are a lot of approaches to be able to navigate. Well, and one other comment I would make is that if, that a trade-off from having those discussions about what would be the best way is to leave it in the hands of one of the partners. And that's a big burden. Mm 
It's a good point. Yeah. Okay, still on the theme of customs and traditions. Is there some custom or tradition that you've experienced either in somebody else's home or in the synagogue or somebody else's synagogue that you liked? And were you able to integrate it in some way in your own life? Like, did you go to a Seder that you really liked and you said, we're going to do that or visited your friend's synagogue? Any thoughts on that? I will say that the Jewish customs and traditions and holidays are one of my favorite parts of Judaism. I love getting, I love Seder. I, yeah, sorry, Richard, but I'm a, I'm a Purim fan. We had a great time last weekend and, uh, it, we, we were not celebrating the death. We were just having a great time with, with Hamantash and all that. Um, but we will do most nights of Hanukkah at, at my house. And I would say that we do more traditions than we do anything else Jewish a, a, in my house. And it's it's very fun. I don't, I don't have a single answer to your question other than right. I, we love love food and, and customs and traditions in general in it. Mm -hmm. I don't know. That makes it fun. Just, just wanted to say, Jack, I think it's really beautiful what the way you're describing it because you're not only enjoying it, but your kids are gonna have wonderful memories of how your family shared that. And mm -hmm. the sense of how much fun it, it is for you is important for them. So I love hearing that, thank you. So one tradition that one of my friends has is um, her um, grandfather was in hiding in the war, World War II, and they had a letter of his. And so every year, I think it was on Rosh Hashanah, their family would read the letter. Mm -hmm. And it was a way of like rededicating themselves in the next year to helping others, thinking about resilience and feeling connected as a family. Um, I haven't found a way to integrate that fully in my own life, not having that letter, <laughs> right. but I like the idea. And I think finding some kind of family historical heirloom that you can, you know, speak about, share, talk about in some way every year makes a lot of sense. I can mention one custom that's been added to Seder's is Miriam's cup, along with the uh, yes, that's nice that we, I guess, picked up from somebody along the way. Mm -hmm. That is very nice. It's nice. I like that. Okay. What is a Jewish tradition or practice that you have that you hope the next generation in your family will carry on? The, the tradition that we we named after the deceased um, because my my I have a, a member of my family who was not this is not the other one I was talking about who married someone who wasn't Jewish and we had a couple of deaths in the family and when it came time to naming the great my great nieces there was all this talk about they didn't care about the Hebrew name you know they were just looking for an English name and that really bothered me and at the time. And there were two of us arguing with them. My brother was alive and I was arguing with them. And we finally got them to agree to look at the Hebrew name first and then go from there. Um, so I would hope that that the tradition of naming someone after, you know, naming a child after someone who had certain attributes and certain, you know, qualities um, remains for the next generation ever, forever. Mm -hmm. You know, and I mean, I told my great niece, she is named after my grandmother, who my, no, sorry, my mother who was named after her grandfather, great-grandfather. So, I mean, and, and now it's coming around and here's this, my great niece who's got that Hebrew name. Um, I think that's wonderful. Yeah, it's lovely. So I think we were already at time, like four o'clock, but we have a few more minutes, I hope, if everybody's okay with that, if we extend just a little bit. Good, nobody's going anywhere. Okay, so we have just, a, um, is there another, this is a nice question. So if somebody else wants to answer this, we'll uh, certainly um, make it available and then we'll maybe pick one more question and then we have um, Jewish name that tune before we wrap up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I just would like uh, children to have 
a Friday night, lighting candles, having the blessings and starting the week, just taking a breath for the week. Mm-hmm. It's Jewish, but it's also healthy. <laughs> right. All right, for um, our final question here, which one do you want to do? So we have a few, so we're trying to we're pick trying which to one. pare it down. Pare it down. Jewish cocktails is always fun, but yeah. Um, let's just end with this fun question about yeah. what is the oddest Jewish food you've ever had or the or best? The best. Right. Any recipes you want to share? Anything that, right, a good Jewish cocktail? Is there such a thing? <laughs> Richard, what is the either oddest or best Jewish food you've had? I think a lot of people think that gefilte fish has got to be the oddest. Yeah, Jewish yeah. Food. Non-Jews do not like gefilte fish. That's even, even some Jews don't like. Do Jews fish. like gefilte fish? No, no. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I love gefilte fish. As long if as there's sweet. horseradish, red if horseradish. It's sweet. <laughs> mm, 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 mm. <laughs> I thought until I had a good one, I thought chulent was pretty odd. Oh, and then yeah. I had a really good version of it. And I was like, yeah, that's not bad. That's good. And we have some cola that Jane made. That wasn't <laughs> good. I don't know, I, I'm partial to a really good kugel. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I always thought it was odd. My parents grew up during the depression and neither of them had money. And so eating Organ meats was very common. And my mother tried to carry that tradition into our house. And I mean, she'd walk in the house with brains. And, <sighs> walk, you know, and she'd sit there smacking her lips. She loved it, you know, and, and liver and, you know, all this stuff. If I never see another set of brains again, I'd be very happy. But yeah, that was a, a taunt. That was, those were the times. My mother walk. loved to make tongue. Yeah, mm-hmm. we had tongue also. Yeah. Oh, but it was good. It was good. Oh, mm-hmm. Good. Oh, it's, oh, oh. I just don't want to see it before they slice it. I don't <laughs> want to see that tongue. <laughs> and then you serve it to your kids and you say, oh, it's taste, it's just like chicken. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we are now going to try to oh, we're gonna tr- yes. try mean that try too. is the oper- operative word here. Um, right. This was designed to go so smoothly and we have had a few glitches along the way. All right. So we're going to, okay. So we are going to try to get to our music. We got it. Okay. So the idea behind this is we are going to play some notes um, you, and you're going to try to just shout out what song you think it is. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, see if we can get all of you there. Great. Sorry, just wanted to make sure we could still see you. Okay, so you should not see our screen. Is that correct? We're not seeing your screen. We're seeing Wonderful. you. Wonderful. Wonderful. Okay. If you can't hear the music, let us know in a minute. That's right. Okay, here goes. Yes, very good. That was why do I care so much? That was nicely done. Okay, we started with an easy one. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. Now we're gonna try this next one. Oh, sorry. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah, good. I got it. I was a music teacher. So. What, what was it? <laughs> hallelujah. Yeah. Leonard, Leonard, Collins, hallelujah. Leonard Collins. There it is. All right. Okay. All right. You might need to get key. You to not guess so much. You're good. <laughs> All right. Here's the next one. A flute version. Let my people go. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Is, 
Is that a nice version? Yes. All right. Another easy one, mm -hmm. but it seemed appropriate for the season. All right. And finally, our last one. Now, this one, um, maybe a little harder. We're not sure. This is a, a song that was popular like 20, 30 years ago, but it just got a revival right. through TikTok. Through, right. So, Jack, you might know it. <laughs> Here we go. Okay, we'll share the screen and you can see. Right. So to just it's it's the Miami Boys Choir, which mm -hmm. is I think New York and Miami, um singing Yerusha Lion. Oh wow. And really? it's yeah, it's really fun. It is really very, fun. very popular. And they um have uh sort of had a bit a resurgence because of this. Some of mm -hmm. them have gone on tour. Yes, I saw a couple of them perform recently this song. But this is, of course, when they were very young. Wait, and you said this is TikTok famous now? It became yeah. TikTok famous. Went viral. Lots of fun. Uh, and these little boys are big boys now. Yeah, they're 30. Yeah, they're very like the original version of BTS. You the 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 Hashem Sobim Liamoy, may I tell me I don't love you. Oh, you're so alive, I hear you so alive. Hurrying Sobim, Hurrying Sobim, Hurrying Sobim, 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 Liamoy, may I tell me I don't love you. You're so alive, I hear you so alive. Hurrying Sobim, Hurrying Sobim, Hurrying Sobim, Sobim, Liamoy, may I tell me I don't love you. We thought we'd give you a taste. You got the gist, right? It's cute. Uh -huh. Um, so thank you for participating today. We, and, we had fun with yes, you. Yes. And thank you for your patience and and uh helping us with the technology. It's delightful. I would like to know how to get TikTok famous like those kids. <laughs> right? Me too. <laughs> I'm happy. For, I'm very happy for them. Right. Yes. Right. 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 They career. had no idea this was going to be in their future. I think one of them is like a gastroenterologist now. <laughs> <laughs> they, but they literally are going on tour singing these songs. I mean, they were very, they're, they're still very popular. They're still a Miami boys choir, but this original group now has a newfound fame, you mm -hmm. know, far and wide. Well, right. This guy has to do it, obviously, when he's not on call, but. <laughs> delightful, delightful. Well, thank you both very much.
and for doing all the work of getting all this multimedia together. And thank you for your open-mindedness about some of our comments. Appreciate it. Oh, no, we appreciate hearing it. It's really nice to be able to get feedback. Definitely. You know that people are engaging critically, thinking very hard about the book, probably thinking more about the book than it was intended to be thought about. Right, but. yes, right. <laughs> that's useful for that, us. We appreciate that. Yeah. We, do. we do, particularly because when we do the sequel, you know, yeah. we're gonna have to yeah. come back to you, right, for some editing. Exactly yeah. right. We appreciate the feedback. Well, and you did, you did Hurts Like a Mother and then you did Hurts yes. Like a Jewish Mother, right. correct? Right. Yeah. Correct. Right. Hurts Like a Mother, no Jewish content. Yeah, do you know what's the next type of mother that you intend on hurting? <laughs> that's a good question. Beyond ourselves. <laughs> right. Right. Um, that is that's a good, a good question. question. Do you have any ideas? Any suggestions? No. I'll have, I'll have to think about it. We've heard, you know, hurts like a single mother, hurts Ooh. like an older mother. You know, there's a few yes. that have been suggested to us along the way. That's, those are some good ideas in there. I'm sure you'll find <laughs> someone. <laughs> Yeah, right. Thank well, thanks again, Thank everyone. you very much. All right. Thank you very much. Thank appreciate you it. so much. We appreciate Have it. It's so nice to meet you and spend the afternoon together. Have a wonderful afternoon. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Well, that's a wrap, everybody.